I think, I mean, just, just, to, just to get that, my single most influential person in my life, in my life was, was my mother. Her determination that she, she I, I witnessed and I saw her, um, you know, go through all those struggles. It's just it's foundational for me, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it formulates the context of who we are as Anishinaabe people. And I use that terminology to include all Indigenous peoples across Canada, especially in light of um, the horrific discoveries that are currently being found in terms of the residential school, but also those impacts that um, have affected us and, and are residual from colonization. Yeah. I think yeah. you and you and I have discussed those things in the past and, and how they impact um, our, our perspectives and our desire to include Indigenous communities in the work that we do. Um, and, and maybe this is a good segue to um, talk about inclusion and talk about individual inclusion in terms of knowing my experience working with you has reinforced the need to support and mentor Indigenous people in executive positions within the mining industry. Um, how do you see our peer group doing this more effectively or more inclusively in terms of bringing in people for um, senior positions within within mining companies? Uh, you know what? I, I think it's 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 probably it, well. I mean, I'll talk a little bit, reflect a little bit on on my experience. You know, I, I mean, I feel in many ways that it, it's it, as somebody working within the industry itself. Um, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of other indigenous people who who are at at the same level that I'm at in terms of senior management. You know, I've been I've been very fortunate over my career to have these experiences that have allowed me to take on bigger and greater challenges, and I've I think I've taken advantage of them to the to the point where I'm where I've gotten to the you know a, a level in my career where I can I can articulate you know um, this this notion of indigenous notion this this very important you know aspect of indigenous inclusion in the industry so um i look around and i and i think about what could have been done better and what can be done better and i think for me it's more it's a lot about recruitment you know there's a lot of very high highly skilled indigenous people out there who aren't working in the mining sector. i think there's an opportunity there for for that to happen i think there's a a real opportunity for things like like this webinar um, with, with organizations like CIM who are who are tackling you know who want to present this subject matter, and 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 have discussions around that and 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 how that can be improved. So I think there's there's that. Um, that's one side of it. I think there's also. Um, I mean, I, I I I talk I talk about both sides when I when I talk about things. For me, it's about you know indigenous communities as well looking at the resource sector as opportunities you know um significant opportunities we, we as an industry we we you know it's it's, a, it's it's wonderful um it's very diverse in not, maybe not in, in in terms of diversity inclusion per se but there's a lot of different areas of the industry um that you can practice in you know there's there's the finance side of it there's the engineering side of the geology um all of those you know, the full gamut of, of things that you can do um, so I think there's there needs probably should be an awakening in terms of indigenous communities as well of the opportunities that exist and 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 you know that's that's one part of it and then of course the, the industry side being being open to to including and, and incorporating more indigenous people so I'll leave it at that I think okay thanks Alan. um so I'm I'm gonna move into this notion that you um, just introduced in terms of um, of economics and finances and, and partnerships and focus on economic reconciliation, right? That's one of the um, TRC's call to action and look at um, how, how do we um, engage communities in the realization of economic opportunities? And what do you think the biggest challenge is in creating partnerships between Indigenous communities and mining companies and what needs to shift in order to make that um, th those partnerships more accessible both at the industry side but also at the community side I think so I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently and I think for me you know the current model that, that is employed is is probably in my mind not a sustainable model and I think it has to be fundamentally turned on its head and easy to say that, hard, hard, much harder to do. And, and, and 
you know, the current model for, for industry, at least the mining sector to engage with communities is, is you, you know, you have a project development or you have something that you want to move forward and, and you're, you're, you will ask, you know, what, what are the regulatory requirements that I need to do? And you're told that you have to go and consult with indigenous communities. So the initial conversation is very much about consultation. It becomes a, a rights discussion. And the indigenous community, on the other hand, sits there and, and, and waits for a proponent to come and, and do, do things to them. And, and they want to talk about their rights and, and, and the land and, and how they can participate. So the initial conversation is very challenging. It's about a rights, it's a, it's a rights discussion and impacts to rights discussion, which is a very narrow, in my mind, a very narrow area to be talking in. Um, that's, the, that's the kind of the playing field. Um, people get through that and they come out the other end of it um, with, with hopefully partnerships where communities are participating in projects, whether it's through you know, contracting opportunities or employment and training opportunities, there's, there's always conversations around that and the, the, the proponent gives up in their mind in some, in some ways, they give up a piece of what, what it is you know, to, to make that happen. And the community is, is, is you know, um, trying to get as much of that, uh, you know, as much of that development as they can. What, what ends up what ends up happening, I think, more often than not, is is both parties are dissatisfied <laughs> um, with with where they are, and and they could, they have to continually work that relationship to make it a, uh, a successful relationship, and hopefully, it evolve into a partnership. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, and it's usually done done under duress. I think. Um, the time is probably now or in the not too distant future where I think indigenous communities really need to think about um, what role they play in resource development in the mineral sector. And mining companies um, need to think about that role as well. Um, we've heard, uh, you know, ample airtime and ample initiatives across, across you know, governments about critical minerals and critical minerals and how important they are to the economy and how important they are to transition to the green economy. I think that um, indigenous communities really need to think about whether or not they wanna get into um, the proponency role and, and, and lead resource development on their territories, as opposed to waiting for resource developers to come and knock on their door and have resource development happen to them. I think they really need to think about how they want to become leaders of resource development. I think um, in the industry as well needs to think about how their current role should shift so that you know, the working with indis indigenous communities in partnership, going out there and looking at resource development together and collectively. I think that to me is going to be the most fundamental shift um, you can see it, you, and you see it now. You see little, little examples of it now. Um, I'll give you an example of, of the Ring of Fire, right? Where, where the proponents for the, road, re, for the roads and the infrastructure are impacting indigenous communities. So they're leading the development. Um, there's talk of those kinds of, there's, those things are starting to happen now. And I think it really needs to happen more at a grassroots level, you know, um, in this, indigenous communities. and and, and it could be junior exploration companies or, 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 or developers can, can go out into the market, into the markets collectively as partners early on to, to you know, get the much needed capital and the investment to, to bring the projects to fruition. So I think that's where things need to go. Um, this current model of, of you know, proponent indigenous community, IBA springs out of that. I think that model is not sustainable. So. Well, and, and we've seen the model that you're talking about happen in the natural gas pipeline industry yes. in terms of equity partnerships looking very different than those that are created through IBAs or CBAs. Yes. So I, I think that that's something that um, we could explore as an industry for sure in terms of building that capacity and those discussions around um involvement of indigenous communities in partnerships that are innovative and and doesn't look like things that have happened in the past or created through an imbalance of um, power 
much like the negotiations that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's it's it's, it's going to require a fundamental shift in thinking, mm -hmm. in in my experience, anyways. I mean, proponents, or at least a lot of not all of them. I'm mean, certainly not everybody, but I mean, proponents, in my experience, tend to view indigenous communities as risks, <laughs> risks to development, impediments to development. Um, and and that's just it's not right. It's it's fundamentally wrong. But that's their that's their initial thinking, and that's part of the role I play is, is, is you know you know working with within organizations within the industry to, to change that kind of view of of what indigenous communities bring to the table. So so that, that needs to shift, right? Is is how do we how do we as a as a company who wants to go and develop a resource include the communities where upon which those where those resources lie as a, as true partners at the early early stages of development um and then on the flip side of it communities need to really really rethink their position i think as well is how do we shift from being you know community who's going to be on the receiving end of a development and we're going to try and get as much of that as much of the benefits as we can through you know the traditional vehicle of, of impact benefit agreement or whatever and actually step out of that role and become you know the leaders of resource development on our territories responsible resource development on our territories mm -hmm. and 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 work together with proponents and i think that's where it needs to go yeah i i wholeheartedly agree with you and i i just attended a um session a conference in vancouver put on by the first nations um, major projects coalition and the same types of discussions are happening mainly in the west around these areas and and i think in terms of discussions that can happen at pdac we should be these are the things that we should be talking about not the same kind of like how do we start conversations with first nations but how do we make them effective partnerships and partners in these discussions yeah. and and taking it out of a we need to do this to minimize risk and we need to do this because it's the right thing to do and we need to include indigenous communities in resource development yep. as part of the economy moving forward i'm going to shift a little bit um although i don't think it's a whole lot because <laughs> i think it's something that you've weaved throughout your your presentation but i wanted to ask you um how do you how do we encourage this concept of moving away from risk, but rather, um, how do we encourage uh, traditional knowledge to be included as part of um, the mining cycle? And how do we see this as an asset as opposed to this concept of a risk or as opposed to something that we need to do in order to get consent or an agreement? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, Again, in my experience, I think traditional knowledge has been in, in for many years uh, an afterthought, really, right? I mean, I'm I'm a I'm educated in a in a Western system of education. I'm an you know my my degree might be in mining engineering, but my professional designation is environmental engineering. So I'm very much about science, and I'm very much about that kind of um, you know that's that's where I, I tend I tended to gravitate towards from for many years of my career. But I've 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 more recently come to align my thinking with with you know what Western science is 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 good but traditional knowledge um, comes from a different place right it comes from people's use of the lands and it's not just um, oftentimes in the Western science world especially in project development you're talking about a one or two or three year type of window of of environmental baseline work you're talking about that kind of timeline. You, if you think about it from a, from a traditional knowledge perspective, you know, land users who've been on the land for, for their entire life and, and, and multi-generational use of lands, to me, the, the integrity of that is, is unquestionable. So, so the, challenge, the challenge, I think, is how do you bring those two worlds together, right? And, and I think it can't be done through, through a regulatory process. It can, I mean, they're, they're, they're regulatory processes are trying to change that now. But I think it goes back to that original, that initial relationship that you develop, right? It, it, it shouldn't be a subject matter in, in, a, in, a, in an IBA. It should, be, it should be just built into it. It should be just natural and flowing. 
and and you use both both traditional knowledge and, and, and Western science to validate what it is you see and validate what it is you do and, and count and, and check and check it as you go, right? I think that's that's where it's, that's where it needs to go as well. Um, how you do that? That's 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 an evolving area, and it's one that I I I still struggle with it too. Is is right? First off, the information has to be forthcoming, um, and 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 I think that's based in part in part by the relationship and in the historical mistrust of of proponents with communities. If you can get over that impediment, and you can get over the you know, and and on the industry side, you know, um, being probably somewhat dismissive of it. I think that needs to shift as well. It, it's it's you know we all we're all on the land together. We're all we all want to we all want to use the land. Um, let's figure out how we can get together and how what what's the best use of the land is, and whether it's you know and in our case in, in the industry's case it's it, we want it to be resource development. I think in community in, in in the indigenous community sense that it's sure we can we can get on board with resource development. I think they need to get on board earlier. Um, but we want it to be responsible resource development, and, and I think to put those two together, and, and there's a, there's an alignment, there's an obvious alignment to me that that it, it you know it, it should be done and it can be done. It's just it's just teeing up the relationship and teeing up the partnership as we talked about earlier, earlier and, and in a different way. Um, and I think to me that will get you you know this this it consent right. I think like I said the current model. I don't think it's sustainable with that. I think you're gonna, it, it injects a lot of risk into, into the, the relationship, both for the proponent and the community because the consent conversation happens at the end of it. Whereas if you do it in a different way, it should be happening at the front end of it, you know, where the, where the, where the, where the proponent and the community are, are working in lockstep to co-develop or, or work together to develop the resource. They've already had the consent conversation. It's just how you go about doing it. So I, I've seen you approach this, practically speaking, in three different ways with a few different communities. And I, where I've seen it work most effectively is you, you, we, our, our team had a, um, an agreement on the side, but the conversations around traditional knowledge inclusion happened be, happened before the agreement was contemplated or was picked apart by legal counsel or chief yeah. negotiators that it, you practically took people on on the site talked to them about what the development looked like and got their input answered questions spent a lot of time working with the community representatives to make them comfortable within that environmental and regulatory process and you didn't do it um, line by line through an agreement you did it by meeting with community members doing site visits having your environmental team come and answer questions there was a lot of diagrams a lot of maps and I felt that that um, the community was very appreciative of that and was brought along in terms of understanding how their information would be included in that environmental chapter and in ultimately the expansion of the mine site. Alternatively, I also saw that um, one of the communities wanted the agreement in place first and that didn't go quite as smoothly. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that that was, a fault of the negotiating team. I think that just the community needed, took a different approach. And I, I think from um, my observation that having a more informal and having a more um, relationship approach was certainly more effective. And, and we were able to do that because we started from ground zero with those communities and brought them alongside in terms of, of that information. And we spent a lot of time um, translating the technical information. So. Um, um, so I, I, I just wanted to reiterate that I think that there are different approaches that companies have to take, 
but the one that I think is more effective is one that starts from the grassroots and and is relationship based and also is a has a lot of time commitment but is practical. Um, I don't know if you have any comments in relation to that. Phone call. Sorry about that. I do. I've seen it both. I've seen it work. I've seen it work both ways. One probably better than the other. Um, you're right. So I got the, the, the relationship. You know, if you, I mean, I've, yeah, the, 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 the whole IBA kind of discussion negotiation plays a part in that. And that, that oftentimes is, is, you know, um, it's always in the background. And I think that's, that's again, why I'm advocating for a different model. Um, you know, um, some communities will take a leap of faith and, and, and share that with you earlier on. And, and I think at the same time, you, as a company, you have to recognize that, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be talking about this. It's important to the community and you have to take it into consideration in what you do. And if you don't, then your credibility goes away pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've been successful in, in a couple of instances where, you know, let's talk about it now. Let's talk about, you know, the traditional knowledge. Let's talk about where people are using the lands and what's important to them and been able to incorporate that into project development and project designs before, before the agreement is done. I think that's where it's, it's shown, shown that it's been very successful. Um, there's a, that's an area that I think um, people need to really think about more so as well. I'll give a, 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 an example I used early on in my career um, with a mine development where, where we went in and we were, we were negotiating with the community um, and, and, you know, there are some people in the community who are using the, 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 the idea that the science that we were collecting or the information we were collecting wasn't, wasn't valid for some reason. And I think it was part of their mistrust of the, of the proponent. I was, I was part of the proponent's team. Um, and I, and I, and I, I, I picked up on that pretty early on. And what, what we did there is, is, you know, usually as a proponent, you're, you're hiring consultants from, from other parts of the country to come in and fly in and, and, and make their way into your site to collect baseline information. So what, what we did in this instance is saying, you know what, we'll, we'll bring the fisheries people or the biology people or the, you know, the technical scientists in, but you're going to be going with community members into the field to collect the data. You're going to be using their, you know, their boats and motors and, and, their, and their people to get you to where you need to get to. So that became like the hybrid team that we use, the hybrid model where, you know, Western scientists and community members were in the field collectively collecting information. So there was an exchange, an organic exchange of information as we were collecting the information. And later on, when we, we were in the community doing open houses, you know, um, the question came up again about the validity of the Western science and, and the same, in, same individuals who were earlier on criticizing um, were the first ones to stand up and say, no, no, that's not the case. I was there. I helped them collect the data. I helped them do all the water sampling. I helped them get them into the bush. We talked about it. My view is that the data is credible because I was there and I helped them collect it. And I shared with them, you know, my experiences on the land. So for me, you couldn't ask for anything better. But the, it's, 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 it's field validation of, of what it is you're trying to do. So then you take that information and you go into a regulatory community and you say, well, it's, it's built in, right? You go into a regulatory process that's built in. I mean, you can't get any better than that, at least in my mind. So that was one of my, one of my success stories early on and have, haven't, I've been able to replicate it one other time. And, and more recently, um, you know, it's, it's, it's oftentimes a little bit after the fact, but again, we're doing it at, like to your point we're we're bringing community members into the field or, or arm waving or, we're pointing at things where, they're asking questions. It's it's a transparent process. You know, it's an organic conversation. Um, it's listening to what they have to say, understanding where their concerns are coming from, and it's not it's not a um, it's not a yes but kind of response, right? It's oh okay, that's that's interesting. Can can we talk about that some more? Let's, let's explore that some more, right? And and you get in and then you really get into get into uh, a more organic. Converse, a more meaningful conversation, I think, and you and you you get you know people on both sides of it who are, are closing the gap 
and and that and 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 closing that gap of misunderstanding of differing perspectives. And I think that's that's an important piece as well. I think the more people do that, the better off they're going to be. Well, and I I've seen you do that and and translate and and translate between that traditional knowledge and the acceptance of that traditional knowledge in terms of mining development. Um, and, and I'll use a particular instance, which I'm, I'm not gonna convey the details about, but it involved um, protection of a sacred site. And, and you, you didn't need to be schooled on what that ceremonial um, significance was or that spiritual significance as land holding a, 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 spir a spiritual entity that you you knew where the communities were coming from and you were able to translate that to um, to your um, your executive team in order to create the protection around that sacred site and I think that I'm I wonder if that's I mean, I know it's because you share in that indigenous perspective, but I wonder how we can help um, our executive colleagues be able to understand that as well. Like, is it is it through us being translators of that information and ensuring that they hear that perspective? Because it's such a foreign concept for for the land to hold a, or um, not not the land per se, but areas of the land to hold specific spiritual um, empowerments. I don't. I don't really know. Um, I mean, I feel like I've been doing it my entire career. I mean, I, I get that. I get the, the, the indigenous lens through my mother and and her. You know, her. I, I've spent a lot of time, you know, talking to her earlier on in my career, and even more recently when I've decided to take other opportunities, but. Um, she's always like, you know, you need to listen. You need to listen to the elders and, and the people who are, who are, you know, in the room talking about things like this that are important. So that was a, a, another lesson that was instilled in me early on. It's like when when the communities talk about, you know, a, a certain area or, or 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 something that's important to them, you have to be able to understand it and, and hear it and 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 pick up on it. And and, and you know, you may don't don't assume. You know, maybe 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 there's an offline conversation about. Can, can you explain to me a little bit more about about what it is you're you're you're, you're talking about here? Uh, you know, and, and sometimes you you, you play. You know, I, you, you come at it from a a, a, a place of, of genuine curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. And and say, okay, this is important to you, so by default, it needs to be important to us, and and. Otherwise, there's going to be a point of conflict that will sometimes blow up to a point where it won't be, you won't overcome it, right? So you got to make sure you, you, you hear it. First off, you hear it. And second part of it is you're able to translate it into, into um, the sector and, and, and the people in the sector and, and the importance of, of what it means to the community, to the people who are doing the engineering and the development, right? It's like you can't go there. And these are the reasons why you can't go there, right? To the extent you know what those reasons are. Um, and you make sure that they don't go there, <laughs> or 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 there's mitigations in place to to ensure that we don't do something that we shouldn't be doing. So um, I feel like I've been doing it all my life, um, but there needs to be there needs to, I think there needs to be an ongoing feedback loop in that regard, um, not just at the front end of a project, but as you move as you continue on through the life of the mine, and even well into closure, right? Well into closure when you're when you're looking at remediating the site is. How how do we how do we make this make this mine site a viable ecosystem post post mining right and how it how it can fit back into the to the mosaic of of, of everything around it so um, it needs to be an ongoing conversation so did I answer the question I don't know if I answered the question <laughs> no you you answered the question and and part of I mean part of what I I do is I teach law students at Osgood Hall. And I've learned a lot from them and, and they've challenged me as much as I've tried to, to teach them. And, and one of the things that they've talked about in relation to various um, environmental sites is that those sites holding um, a spiritual significance that in a legal sense will give them um, the power of a person. 
and that concept has I've tried to um, I've tried to balance with indigenous knowledge and indigenous legal doctrines, and I think I think they're quite compatible. Now, articulating them is another. Feeling them is one thing. Articulating them in a way that brings others who don't have these concepts or feel them the same way is another thing. And I've I've seen you effectively do both. And just wanted to say that um, I've I've learned that from you and learned also to be an advocate where it's it's seemingly um, those voices are missing. Yeah, um, I think I'm a little. I think I'm fortunate in, in in the sense that I'm I'm at a place in my career and in a level of, of of in the in the industry where I, where I do have that voice and an incredible voice. You know, I I mean, as a, as, as a vice president of a mining company, I'm I'm talking to to the, our CEO and our and our C suite and everybody and my colleagues, and so I have I'm in a place where I I'm able to, I think, um, exert more more change and more influence. Um, but, and, and, and I, and I'll be honest, I, I mean, I do talk to our, our board and I, you know, I explain some of these things to them as well. And our, 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 our boards and, and, and boards that I've been able to deal with are highly intelligent people. And they understand, you know, the importance of the importance of these things. They may not understand the, how to go about it part, but they understand that, that it's important. And, and so they're struggling with, with how sometimes how to do it. So I, I think I offer up and a lot of times how how would you go about it so um yeah it's it's been it's been it's one of my favorite areas is, is, is one of the reasons i do it is to be able to bring those two perspectives together and articulate um how we can how we can work together well and i and i think that um your type of advocacy is much needed and and i think the more that we participate in those leadership conversations at the board level, the more that um, people will be open-minded to understanding things in a different way and looking at um, environmental regulations in a different way, because we need to, and we need to do that for the protection of mother earth. And we need to do that for the sustainability of the environment around us. Um, which leads me to um, my next question is, how do we look at ESG through an indig Indigenous lens? Or more specifically, how do we include an I for Indigenous in ESG? Um, let's see, I have a, I have a, a SG frameworks. And <laughs> the reason, the reason I say that is, is that, um, I think it, it, the love part of it is this, is that I think ESG frameworks and ESG um, has really forced the industry to look internally to, to what it does. And I think that's a good thing. Anytime that you're, you know, you, you, you're, you're looking at yourself and looking in the mirror and saying, we, we really should be better at this. Uh, that's, that's a good thing for me. And I think ESG has really helped do that. It's one of the things that helped do that. I think strong leadership is another ingredient there, and 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 you know, leadership that looks at, at at not just the sector but at the industry, at the world as a whole, and and where we fit in that. Um, another thing that I've been really really gifted with in my career is that is that as well. Um, so I, I I like what ESG frameworks and ESG reporting does. Um, to your point about the, the the indigenous part of it, I think that's where I find it. I, we'll call that the hate part. I don't know if hate's probably too strong a word. Um, if you look at ESG frameworks now nowadays and where they are, I mean, wonderful that there was that they're in place and 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 five, 10 years ago, indigenous indigenous people weren't even really talked about mm -hmm. in those frameworks. But now it's shifted to a indigenous rights discussion, which which I really, and it's again, it goes back to a, a narrower conversation about how am I as a proponent impacting your rights and how am I mitigating my impact to those rights as opposed to, um, you know, how can we work together to successfully develop this resource? And that's where I struggle with. It's, it's all about rights impacts and, 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 you know, mitigation of rights and respecting, there, there's pieces that are important. It's respecting culture and connectivity to the land and, and those kind of things. Um, but again, I think that's a, that's a, I don't want to say it's a narrow conversation, but 
I'll, I'll say it's a narrower conversation. It's about rights and impacts to rights and how we're mitigating them versus what I talked about earlier about, about looking at resource development com from a completely different perspective. So um, if you, if you, if you, again, those frameworks will, will kind of push you down the path that we're already on, right? It's, it's the path that we're already on where it's about a company going, going into an area and trying to extract a resource in the community, waiting for somebody to come in and do something to them, i.e. extract, extract the resource and trying to figure out how much of the benefits can accrue to the nation. I think, I don't like, I don't like that. Um, I think it needs to fundamentally change. That. Yes, and we need to be <laughs> trailblazers in that conversation and allow people to have tools. And I think that this is what's missing is that we need to figure out what those practical tools are. We're shifting that conversation to a way that's more um, inclusive and allows for more Indigenous perspectives to be heard as opposed to be imposed on them. So I, I think that there we're probably sharing a lot of the same perspectives in that area as well. Um, yeah, I think if you start to, just to stay on that point, Saga, I think if you get the more people, the more ind Indigenous people who come into the sector and the more Indigenous people who, who can take leadership roles in the sector, I think the less it's going to be about, it's going to be about that, right? It's going to be about how am I impacting my, my Indigenous community partners and, and, and how can I mitigate those impacts versus how can we partner with them? I think there's more um, the more the more people come into the sector, and the more people who are who are you know advocating for that, I think that's that that's where it will shift. So. Yeah, agreed. Um, so I know that we only have a couple of more minutes before there's a Q and A portion of our discussion, but I wanted to ask you in closing: Was there anything else that you wanted to mention or impart on those participating today? Mm -hmm. Not, 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 maybe, yeah, maybe a couple of, couple of thoughts, I think. Um, for me, it's, it's about, I think it's about trying to, for people who maybe who are on the call wondering about this thing, I think for me, one of the important pieces of it is, is, is understanding the different perspectives and, and, and tr figuring out a way to bring those perspectives together. Um, that's to me, a critical piece of it. Um, I think the landscape that's out there is changing and shifting and it's going to force that to happen. Um, the second point is it's, it's, I mean, I look around the, the industry and I look around inter internal to the industry and it's sometimes it's a lonely place to be. I don't see a lot of other people like myself and yourself who could pick up the phone and, and, and call and say, you know, I had this thing happen to me this week, or I had this experience. This, you know, what did what did you do about it? I think, I think for for Indigenous people out there, I think it's it, this industry is a really really interesting industry. It's really good. It's rewarding, and I think uh, don't be don't be afraid to to jump in and 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 come join us. It's it's a uh, it's very rewarding career, and uh, yeah, I'd like to see more of that. So I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks, Colin, and thanks. Thanks for having this conversation with me and, um, and thanks for sharing your wisdom with all of those who are participating today. And I'll turn it over to um, Cassandra at this point in order to, um, to ask those Q's and A's. All right. Well, well, thank you both. Um, on behalf of the CIM, it's, it's been fascinating and I really appreciate your time and energy to be with us today. I'll mention for the folks in the audience, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, one question, uh, and touching back to the discussion around uh, Indigenous communities taking the lead for responsible resource development. So in your opinion, I'm, I'm wondering, what actions can industry be taking to help support and, and empower communities, either in having the confidence or gaining the skills um, to actually to step up more effectively into this leading role? Um, let's see, I, 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 maybe, I mean, this might be part of my have a dream speech, Cassandra. <laughs> I, 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 look at the, I look at the junior sector particularly, right? The junior, the junior exploration sector where, where you know, they, 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 they've, they've, you know, they've staked out some property, they have some, some access to some claims that they wanna go and explore. 
and they also need money, right? They need they need other people's money, and they need they need the financial wherewithal to go do that. I I think to me there's the opportunity there's an opportunity there. Indigenous, you know, and indigenous communities that you know are oftentimes, as I mentioned, are 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 kind of viewed as risks, right? And how do I mitigate the risks? Well, I mean, if if proponents went knocking on community doors much sooner than they do, um, and said, hey, you know, we're interested. We, we've just staked some ground here and we want to come and work with you. And how can we collectively go ahead, go out to the market at large and, and figure out how we can get, you know, the resources to, to jointly develop this thing. Um, I think that's from an industry perspective, a, a way to do it. Um, you know, go knock on doors and say, are you interested in, joining us in this in this in this development if i was if i was a financier or somebody looking at projects right geology aside and and, and all those other kind of technical issues aside um and i saw two two projects that were very similar if i had uh, the indigenous community of, of where the project is going to happen or the communities where the development is going to potentially happen sitting at the table saying we're, we're partnering with this individual and we want to develop this resource together. I would look at that in a, in a, in a better light than, than if the community wasn't there. And I was wondering about what their position was. That to me is is the way to go. Yeah, and, and definitely I know, I think finding, having the perspective and the wisdom to know when that right point to engage is, that an area has potential, um, but without creating expectations that can't be met. That, that balance. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <clears throat> yeah, um, let's see. And I suppose there, there isn't any questions in the chat yet. Um, so is there any other comments that you would like to share? Anything that you'd like to emphasize in the last few minutes before we close out this morning? Well, I do see a question in the chat. So. Do we have one? Oh, just came in. Yeah, it just came in. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Andrew, would you, I don't know if you can go off mute, would you like to ask directly? Sure, I, I can do that. Um, great talk, Colin. Really uh, interesting to hear your experience and, and partly leaning on that experience. Just curious if on specifically around, I've wondered about equity participation. So things like shares and options in a junior create a upside potential. Um, and wondering in the past, I think people said too complicated you know, finance people wouldn't like it. Just curious if you've seen any evidence of more creative solutions using that particular type of approach. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually seen it quite a bit, Andrew. I know, I know, it, I've seen it quite a bit in the junior sector, where where you know shares or options are part of part of a what's called an exploration agreement per se. Um, and again, it's 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 one of that. It's a part of that little. It's part of the overall participation package. Um, it, it's it's i think it has its place um you know it, it allows the community to to not, well it allows the proponent to offer up something that that they typically or that they have right which is which is shares and or shares or options in a, in a small startup or a small company and allows the community some sort of upside exposure to to the development i don't necessarily know if it qualifies as as meaningful partnership per se um, from the purest sense, in the sense that the community is is helping helping the proponent go raise the money, helping the proponent, you know, do the do the heavy lifting for for the development. Um, I, I, yeah, I think it's it has its place. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Colin, Saga, very appreciate your time today. It's been an excellent discussion. Great, thank you so much. Take care everyone.